everyone, and welcome to this episode of Medicine and the Machine. Uh, this is Abraham Verghese, and I'm with my co-host, Eric Topol. And we're delighted today to have uh, two guests on our show. Uh, first is the writer, Emma Goldberg, and I'll tell you a little bit about her. She has a new book, Life on the Line, Young Doctors Come of Age in a Pandemic. Emma is a reporter at the New York Times. I'm sure you've seen some of her work. Um, writing for such sections as the health and science, uh, styles, gender, uh, and culture, among other stories. And uh, this book emanates from one of her uh, pieces that um, I think is just quite remarkable, uh, a story that she's going to tell us a lot more about. Uh, it basically is the tale of the COVID epidemic in New York City, but told through the characters of six medical students at the time we're now interns and we're now privileged to have one of them with us and that is Sam Dubin. So uh, Emma and Sam, welcome. This is just a, a wonderful story and so good to have both of you here. Thank you Thank so you. much for having us on. And Sam is the real expert on, I'm sure, everything we're gonna talk about. So I defer to him, <laughs> but I am grateful to you, um, both of you for having both me and Sam on the show. This is a, a real honor. You know, I'm going to start by reading a the only passage from the book that I'm going to read is this passage that really kind of uh, blew me away because it was so uplifting. There were many uplifting moments, but I think this was particularly one. And this is to do with the uh, intern Ben or the student Ben. And it goes like this. The brightest moments in Ben's week came when the hospital halls rang with Jay-Z's Empire State of Mind which meant a COVID patient was being extubated or discharged. Each hospital had its own soundtrack. Lennox Hill played the Beatles, Here Comes the Sun, with nurses calling, Code Sun, Code Sun. Hackensack University Medical Center played Bill Withers' Lean on Me. Maimonides in Brooklyn rotated hits like U2's Beautiful Day and the Rocky theme. And New York City's Metropolitan in East Harlem chose the Journey classic, don't stop believing um, because this was really a tale of such tragedy, such uh, overwhelming uh, onslaught of very, very sick patients. And uh, to me, that moment really stood up. But I want to begin by, by asking you, Emma, how did you meet Sam? How did you meet the other uh, medical students? How did you arrive at this structure for telling this story? That's a great question and a really exciting place for me to start because I think the reason I was so drawn to the story of the medical students who graduated early was that it ultimately felt like a bright spot and a sort of glimmer of hope in the midst of the crisis in New York in that the medical students turned doctors who I met were the people who were giving me the most inspiration and hope in the early weeks of the pandemic. Um, in April in New York last year was a really dark time, as Sam can tell you even more viscerally. Um, the, the streets were really empty, the hospitals were full, and all you could really hear all day was the sound of sirens. And for journalists, it was a sort of moment of paralysis because we're used to being able to go out and about and report and, and really be in the thick of things. And instead, you know, newspaper offices emptied out. Everyone was sort of in their homes reading headlines about this war zone like um, atmosphere in the city. And so getting to speak to medical students who were actually mobilizing and doing something extremely constructive and valuable in the moment was a real bright spot for me. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be connected to um, uh, doctors like Sam through medical schools like NYU and Albert Einstein who um, reached out to students and, um, and connected me with some people who were willing um, and generous enough to share their experiences as they were working these long shifts in the hospital. That's wonderful. Uh, Sam, so um, the book really begins with you and it also ends with you. Um, uh, delighted to have you here. And that must have been quite a shock to be a, a final year medical student and suddenly watch this happen. And tell us a bit about how you wound up, you know, volunteering essentially to, to work in the hospital. Um, absolutely. So I think as Emma at some point describes in her book, you know, the reputation of fourth fourth year of med school is often a, a very expensive vacation, or at least one that has uh, the pressure cooker of the early year, years is, uh, is released somewhat, especially post-match data, wherever you're moving and starting. 
Um, and obviously this, this one didn't keep to the textbook. Um, so I think a lot of us were ready and waiting and already in a mindset to say, you know, we, ha we have these skills, we've matched and we're just kind of waiting to start. And I think for many of us who, you know, had the, the time and privilege to be able to step forward and offer ourselves in this way, it, it, and while it was a very surreal circumstance in order to do so, it certainly fit with the narrative, you know, we're going to be otherwise quarantined in our homes figuring out a way to volunteer and actually, you know, in less than two months anyway, this is the same skill set we're supposed to start developing, certainly in a very different context. But I think for a lot of us, the it was, you know, when we took a step back and looked at everything else going on and weighed the decision, it was, uh, I think a lot of us were happy to do it. You know, we're coming out of a training, uh, we have those skills and certainly the need was very present in, in more ways than we're used to, I think as healthcare providers. Emma, before I uh, turn it to Eric, uh, uh, to just finish, follow up on that first question I asked you, uh, and Sam, you, Sam, thanks for that wonderful answer, very, very erudite explanation of how you came to this. Uh, talk about the structure. I mean, you could have told the story in so many different ways. I'm glad you told it the way you did, but did you wrestle with that? Did you, did you arrive at that by accident? How did you get to this using six characters to tell the story? That's a great question. Um, I was following um, a, a greater number of doctors toward the beginning and um, over time winnowed down partly based on just who is willing to kind of continue updating me and providing me with, you know, real information and kind of as much detail as they could about what, what they were seeing and experiencing. Um, and, and ultimately, I did want it to include doctors who had all different interests, had come from all different communities and all different perspectives. And so the doctors I followed in the book all represent kind of new aspects of, of what it means to be drawn to medical care and, and new sort of specific interests within that. There was a young um, Orthodox Jewish woman who wrestled with questions of, of her faith. Um, there was a, a young uh, first generation American who had grown up with a family that was in some ways skeptical of, um, of Western medicine and of the US healthcare system in particular. So I wanted to follow doctors who brought um, in some ways surprising or unexpected or um, just diverse viewpoints um, in terms of their medical interests. And then um, the, the decision to bring in some of the, the history of the US medical system and, and of particularly of medical education was sort of an organic one that, that came about in that um, it began to just feel to me like a broader story about the changing face of medicine, the changing norms um, and, and perspectives of, of younger doctors. And I wanted to contextualize that by looking at um, the histories that inform how we actually got to the, the current state of US medical education. And that led me um, down some paths toward the Flexner report, um, toward the kind of histories of paternalism in the system. So I knew that I wanted to kind of bring in different threads that would um, inform particularly lay readers who aren't as familiar with the history of US medical education. Well, it's such an extraordinary book, Emma, and congratulations on it. Uh, it's a phenomenal contribution about medical education and historic time. I, I go to Sam and, uh, you know, I think what's really fascinating is kind of like going in the deep section of the pool when you start your internship normally, learning how to swim. But this was uh, obviously uh, couldn't be more of a contrast. You're learning how to swim in uh, the worst pandemic and at Bellevue Hospital, no less, the place where, uh, you know, it's kind of been ground zero for uh, HIV and, and now with COVID. So didn't you have a lot of trepidation, even though you were eager to kind of get, um, get started in your medical real career? beyond just the med school part? I admittedly likely should have had more trepidation than I did and not, not out of bravery, but perhaps out of uh, cabin fever from pandemic. And I, I think just eagerness to start. Uh, at NYU, the early graduates were put where their sub-internships were. So we had some familiarity with the system in that regard. Um, but to your point, uh, I, I, when we arrived there, the system was not functioning as anyone knows the system to function. Um, and I think when we started, I think the, you know, we showed up in April and we're, I was there April and May. And I think, 
not necessarily that the wave had crested, but uh, it was still very much up in the air. And I think that said, there were a few people in front of us in line, the current the house staff that was there currently and other uh, you know, additional support staff who'd either been relocated or redeployed. So I think part of what, uh, what helped with the trepidation was uh, not just you know going crazy from being in my apartment for a month or two, but knowing that in some ways we know that that system's there and who we're working with, especially you know seeing people from our pediatric clerkships now with us on medicine or uh, you know a fellow from endocrinology who'd finished residency there the year before but was now the attending for me as an early graduate. So. Um, it, it was a sort of bizarre community that was still a community. Um, that said, there was, you know, certainly like this getting home and showering immediately and looking at my scrubs as though they were toxic um, versus just the normal C. diff spores or MRSA, <laughs> you know, that I'm scared of. Uh, you know, that I think I had to unlearn later. And there's certainly still things now where you know, their habits as an intern, you're like, you know, as you become a resident or that transitioning is happening, you start to look at, but um, certainly like, at the beginning, there's a mix, excuse me. I like the name of your cat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will, uh, I'll feed that back to my partner. <laughs> you, you have to explain that uh, to our, to our listeners. So her, her, a name is uh, Avita Carroll. Apparently she, she came as uh, a diva, which was a little too on the nose for my partner. So he called her Avita because she thought she had a uh, sort of Avita Perone by way of sort of the Broadway uh, stylings essence to her. And then Carol was uh, appended so he could, you know, do his own naming as well as honor one of his favorite uh, recent movies <laughs> in its own styling. Yes. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, Emma, I want to follow up on Eric's question because in many ways, uh, Bellevue could have been the centerpiece for the whole, the whole book. Um, and it's such a storied hospital. And I remember reading a, a book by an eminent historian just about Bellevue. We've had uh, Danielle Ufri on our show here, uh, and many of her stories and her writing is centered on Bellevue, which, is, as Eric pointed out, is such a storied hospital, you know, from 1816, always at the forefront of, you know, immigrants and new diseases, new epidemics, and especially in the HIV era. And then it just became overwhelmed with, uh, with COVID. So talk a little bit about that, both of you, if you would, about Bellevue and, and what you saw, how they handled it. Um, absolutely. Well, one of the, the most fascinating moments for me, I would say, was picking up David Oshinsky's um, history of Bellevue last spring. And, and I was reading that as I was speaking with, with um, some of the doctors around New York who were going in and out of the COVID wards and reading um, uh, uh, Dr. Oshinsky's um, account of um, uh, the history of Bellevue includes um, journal entries from interns who were working at Bellevue during the HIV crisis. And it includes the, um, the experiences of people who saw other epidemics hitting, um, hitting New York over the decades, um, typhus and um, so many other diseases. And some of, the, um, some of the words of those doctors, it felt like I was reading like modern day accounts of people who were witnessing COVID. Um, and they were fascinating. One of them talked about seeing, you know, wealthy New Yorkers fleeing New York um, in the 1860s. And it was like, they saw the, the chariots flowing out of New York City and it felt like people escaping Pompeii while the lava was flowing. There were these like visceral moments that felt like it mapped so precisely on what we were witnessing. And this was at the time when you were seeing people leaving New York City in droves um, and, you know, just these eerily empty streets. And then you were seeing, um, I was reading the accounts of, of doctors who were in the AIDS wards at Bellevue and um, were talking about the kind of simultaneous fear um, and pride and also just the, the real grief of seeing patients there who didn't have uh, visitors or family members with them. And so it, it felt like this really um, intense experience to read all of these accounts from doctors at Bellevue over the centuries that felt so attuned to the experiences of, of what people were talking about seeing in the COVID wards. Um, and, and that was a real fascinating moment for me because it just felt like um, the, the history was coming alive and also like um, there, there were people really walking in the footsteps of that history and honoring what Bellevue has always really stood for, which is being at the forefront of New York City's response to various epidemics. 
for me, looking at Bellevue as like a character in the book was a really um, emotionally intense experience because you just saw um, the the way these storylines of, of epidemics and um, and crises repeat themselves, and the the really courageous role that doctors continue to play in them as they as they always have. So getting to kind of touch on that history was uh, fascinating for me. I think uh, it, it probably won't surprise many of our listeners, um, but I'm sure some it must have been a surprise to you, or maybe not, to find how much of your work revolved around almost social issues, um, you know, dealing with all the things that were bigger than COVID. I mean, there were people who were coming from Rikers Island prison and, you know, the, their issues in their mind were COVID was only a small part of that. And could you speak to, to that a little bit? Of course. Uh, I think, you know, of them, COVID disrupted all systems, not just healthcare delivery and who, who was deployed where in the hospital. And uh, for folks listening, uh, Bellevue is one of uh, Health and Hospitals, which is New York's, you know, public city hospital system. It's one of, I believe me, 12 or 13 hospitals, um, but it is a flagship in that uh, sort of the, uh, it has one of the highest level of resources. So many folks from all over the city end up getting transferred to Bellevue if they need cardiac catheterization or a potential neurosurgical intervention. So uh, although you know, geographically, we're in sort of Far East Side without subway access <laughs> for those listening from New York. Uh, we get everyone from all over the city. So we were, you know, not spared any, any part of what the city saw. The timing of this pandemic and me graduating early and seeing Bellevue as a place where HIV and AIDS had been an epicenter was, uh, I think, something I'm still processing. I think coming into my interest of LGBTQ health in college, I was sort of following the opioid epidemic as the modern day parallel. And then all of a sudden I'm the one responsible for bringing in a food tray because the ancillary staff isn't vaccinated and doesn't have enough masks. Or I'm the one responsible standing there sweating in my PPE, holding up the phone because a loved one can't come in the room to have a discussion about the end of life. And I think it's easy to forget I think anyone's job in healthcare, I mean, there's so many things and you're like, you can forget you're at Bellevue. Um, and one of the joys of talking to Emma was sort of like, oh, this is, this is happening. But, you know, certainly Emma tells the story of my experience with a patient who was, you know, incarcerated at Rikers Island and because of the pandemic, that incarceration ended in the midst of his hospitalization. And I think you know, we're used to sort of trying to navigate that system as best we can as healthcare providers at Bellevue, but it was just one more disruptive thing that COVID took the curtain off of and we got to see that system even more so for what it was and how it impacted our patients. Medicine and the Machine will be right back. Welcome to Medscape's latest podcast series, Medicine and the Machine, featuring Medscape's Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eric Topol, and Master Storyteller and Clinician, Dr. Abraham Verghese. Remember, you can find the latest in medical news, expert perspectives, clinical tools, continuing medical education, and more at Medscape.com. One of the things that I guess is somewhat surprising that came out of all this uh, because of its surreal, uh, intense, nightmarish um, situation is that medical student applications have soared tremendously, like we've never seen. Um, I'm not sure that's, you know, what they're, what they're getting into, of course, but I wonder if we could get both of you to comment about that, because this is uh, something that um, is kind of reigniting the enthusiasm, excitement about being a doctor, which we haven't seen in a long time. Yeah, I think that um, those are the numbers I've seen as well, that there's been like an 18% jump in applications um, and a, actually a parallel jump in applications to nursing schools as well, mm -hmm. which um, is fascinating. But to me, it wasn't um, all that surprising after having talked with um, people like Sam who decided to graduate early and, and go right into the hospitals. Because um, I think what I heard from talking with so many people was just a sense of, um, and Sam will speak to this better, but a sense of obligation and just the sense that um, there's value in being able to put the skills to use that you've been you've been trained with. You know, you've done the hard work, and you want to be able to help. 
And there's never really been a moment where we've seen so viscerally how much we rely on healthcare providers. We had that, um, my, I mean, my favorite part of the day last spring was that 7 p.m. applause because I would always go out onto the street and you would just like hear it ringing out. It was really the, the loudest moment of the day um, on my street aside from the sirens. And there was that like tribute being made because I think everyone in the city was viscerally aware that while so many people were locked in their homes, the people doing the real work out there were healthcare providers. Um, and without those people making the sacrifices, you know, we would just be in far greater trouble than, than we were. Um, and, and I think what I heard from talking with a lot of the, the doctors I followed was that um, actually a lot of their, um, a, a lot of the sense of trepidation from people I spoke with was not so much about, you know, putting themselves at risk because they knew that was what they'd been trained and, and what they prepared to do. I think it was more from some of them actually a concern about sometimes not actually being able to do all they wanted for patients. And, you know, there were some situations where doctors were showing up and um, a, a young woman named Iris, who I followed, I remember one of her first patients um, died really shortly after being admitted. And she had this moment of thinking, um, you know, she knew she'd made the right decision and going to graduate early and work in the hospital. Her regret was just that she couldn't actually do all the life-saving work she wanted to do. And this disease was so novel and um, and she and her coworkers were still figuring out what they could do in certain moments to actually like put to um, put to use the life saving skills they were trained with. So I think the trepidation was coming um, more from you know not being able to do everything people possibly wanted to, less less from the um, um, from the work of actually putting um, their own health on the line. So I think that th there's a real sense of like duty, obligation, and courage that so many of us saw um, reflected in healthcare providers over the last year. Um, and I think medical students and, and medical school applications um, are speaking to that and, and to that like spotlight that was put on the absolutely invaluable work of healthcare providers. You know, a significant part of your book, uh, uh, rightly so, is about the phenomenon of race and medicine. And, uh, you know, there was a disproportionate number of people of color and uh, people, you know, um, disadvantaged by the healthcare system who suffered uh, COVID and died in numbers greater than other groups. And uh, actually just to, to tout something that we just published in JAMA online, uh, the numbers of physicians who died in the period that we studied using public databases like Medscape and The Guardian who were keeping track of these things. Of the 132 physicians who died, a disproportionate number were foreign medical graduates. You know, there's about 25% of the nation's physicians are foreign medical graduates, but the percentage who died was higher and it was also disproportionately higher in places like New York City, uh, New Jersey, where I, uh, there are more uh, there was a, you know, a bigger epidemic at that time, a bigger surge, but also I think many of them chose to live there. Uh, Filipino nurses, we also know, have suffered disproportionately. Um, so I was really, you know, pleased to see you engage with race and talk about, uh, for example, the Oakland Men's Health Disparities Project, which is done by some of my colleagues here. I'd like both of you to reflect on on race and COVID as you saw it, uh, you know, at ground zero there in New York City. Thank you for asking a question about this. One of the unique things of working at Bellevue is it's both a city hospital and a hospital for the world. There's people from all over. And I remember discussing with Emma, you know, she had, had asked me a few questions about sort of witnessing health disparities. It was sort of these early numbers, these sort of harrowing numbers of which communities were being more impacted and disproportionately impacted were coming to light. And my reflection, uh, to summarize it here, and it certainly uh, wasn't glib at all, was to say, like, we knew that. Uh, these are things we knew. And unfortunately, it's making headlines now, and it's making headlines for the wrong reason. It was one of those things where it, it takes a tragedy for the spotlight. And certainly, you know, folks like Emma and lots of people do that work. You know, my experience of the early, you know, health disparities and inequities in the pandemic were, you know, consistent with what I'd already seen um, and had been exposed to clinically in my own education at NYU and in New York. And unfortunately, you just you, you saw when the families weren't in the room, when other family 
members were in some other hospital room somewhere else and couldn't pick up your phone. You saw what resilience uh, and resources those communities have. You saw those get even more impacted. And I think COVID, you know, I keep saying it took a curtain off things and that was in one way where uh, it really shined a light, at least for me and, you know, how do I provide not only competent care to everyone, but, you know, make sure I'm acknowledging what folks show up to clinical spaces with. You know, it's one thing to have your own politics and your approach to things to sort of see it and see what the investment of energy and uh, empathy and time takes was certainly uh, one of those early walls that in my, you know, experience working during COVID, I, I definitely hit that. And I, you know, something I thought, I, you know, I know these things, and this is something I want to do. And then when you, when you're actually, you know, not just an intern, but showing up and especially in a pandemic, you're like, oh, okay. So of course, easier said than done, but this is how it looks. This is what it looks like for me um, when it looks like that for community and how do I, you know, figuring out practically what to do to bridge that because it's not live. I'll go back and reiterate this in case it's too long, but I, I do really think that of the many things the pandemic exposed, I think there were some people who, you know, on the patient and healthcare consumer size lived these things already and knew them. Um, and then on the provider side had seen these. In some ways, I think it was not a new a new experience, but a new story that uh, the media in many ways started telling. Um, I completely agree with everything Sam said um, and, and also really appreciate the question. And I, I do think that there is an extent to which the last year kind of shows the, the health and, and the life and death consequences of representation in medicine too. Um, and and I, it speaks to the Oakland Men's Health Disparities Project that, that you brought up um, because you know, and I remember in the early weeks of the pandemic, there was a report from the city of New York that said Black New Yorkers were dying at twice the rate of, of white New Yorkers from COVID, as were um, Hispanic New Yorkers also at around twice the rate. Um, and, and then you, you look at those statistics in conjunction with the evidence that shows that, um, that Black and Hispanic patients often actually have better health outcomes when they're seen by um, doctors who look like them. And it speaks to the real, um, the real stakes of representation in medicine and, and the kind of real, um, the, the urgency around widening the pipeline and boosting the, the number of Black and, and Hispanic physicians represented in the workforce, which is, you know, both under 6%. Um, I, I think we're fortunate to have access to more and more evidence that shows um, that, that like empirically, that um, health outcomes are better for Black patients when they're seen by Black doctors, because that can just, you know, boost and amplify the calls to have more representation in the medical field. I was really floored when I saw that, that study um, from Dr. Owen Garrick and Dr. Marcella Alson um, documenting that Black patients are more likely to agree to, um, you know, diabetes screenings and cholesterol tests when they're seen by Black providers. And it's just, I think we're really fortunate to be living in a moment where we're able to document um, why it's so important to continue to, to boost the numbers of, of um, uh, you know, physicians from all different communities and all different backgrounds. And now I think the real work is around um, thinking about what does it actually look like to, to actualize those calls um, for representation, not just pay lip service to it, but to really look at um, who has um, access to the pipeline and how are we eliminating also all of the sort of invisible costs that go into medical training, whether it's you know pricey study banks, um, flashcard banks, uh, exams, flying to interviews. Um, there, there's all of these kind of hidden costs, I think, too, to becoming a doctor. And I think starting to look at um, the real stakes of representation and um, and and all the the steps that it'll take to boost who's represented in the field. I think that's kind of some of the work coming out of the pandemic. And, and as Sam said, I think so many people have known this for a long time. And now it's about thinking about um, how do we sustain the energy in these conversations and not um, allow them to just kind of fizzle out as we're coming into the new stages of reopening. For our listeners, uh, we're listening to uh, Emma Goldberg and Sam Dubin. Emma is the author of the book, Life on the Line, Young Doctors Come of Age in a Pandemic. It's truly a remarkable story. And as we wind this down, I want to ask both of you um, for sort of what is the take home message? Uh, you know, for me, it was a very hopeful one, I should tell you. I felt like inspired to know that, you know, that medicine is in the hands of people like Sam and Iris and all the other wonderful students who are now residents uh, that you describe. And I also want to ask Sam about 
uh, Emma chose to end the book with the, the pride march. Uh, and I think it's a great metaphor for, for hopefulness. So I wanna ask both of you about your take home message and especially Sam about what the march meant and symbolized at this, at this period in time. So something I take away from my understanding of you know, LGBTQ history is that right after Stonewall, there had been activist movements before, but the new trajectory was this all encompassing idea of like our system, the folks oppressing us and the systems that oppress us are not separate from other things. And without getting too, <laughs> too excited about, you know, queer history, but this idea that I learned in my history class, I always found compelling and, and I certainly see it in health. And I think, uh, I appreciate and understand uh, Emma's choice to end with that because I, for me, uh, to be at what was actually the 50th anniversary of uh, the first Pride March, not Stonewall itself, and something that had no, you know, had no per parade permit and was the unofficial one, and uh, you know where there was police intervention in a way that was not, uh, you know, that there was violence, you know, there was violence uh, and to be, you know, on a day off from my rotations in a COVID ward and to be there uh, was to very much have a lot of things, I think, collide for me um, in a way where, it, you know, it was just another Sunday, but in reflecting on it and certainly having the privilege of reading about it with Emma's writing to say that, you know, the identity I bring and my experience I bring uh, to healthcare is these reminders of it, that it's, uh, you know, it's not, learning about it in class anymore. It's about doing it and living it. Uh, and it was, and it's been a, you know, a, a privilege to have these conversations with Emma and hear her articulate these stories, including my own, uh, you know, to add that to my own sort of living with it and reflecting on it as well. Yeah, I think, well, first of all, I want to just say, I mean, you are all, all three of you people who do such powerful work on medical storytelling. And I, um, that's something I'm very interested in as, as a non-physician is just thinking about how do we tell the stories of people on all sides of the medical system, whether it's um, patients or doctors or nurses or PCAs or others, and think about how to really humanize the field. Because I think sometimes um, people who are outside of the medical field don't always know about their, their entry point in or, or their ways of kind of communicating and understanding the stories that animate why doctors do the work they do. Um, and, and I think one of the, um, the things that I found really striking about the last year from talking with doctors at different levels of the medical field was hearing about some of the ways in which COVID shook up clinical norms in different ways. And in, and in some ways also almost like bent hierarchies. And, you know, there were um, people in, in very high levels of hospitals who were changing bedpans and there were people who were stepping into um, more senior roles than they normally would. And there was just this real... From, from what I heard of it, a real like all hands on deck atmosphere and a, and a sense that people were stepping up and, and stepping together and um, lifting up one another's work. Um, and, and I think something that, that I came away from that with is just that there are people at all levels of the medical system with such powerful, urgent perspectives on, um, on medical care, on clinical care, on patient doctor relationships um, and on the shifting norms of medicine. And I think um, as, as a person who comes at this from a storytelling, um, not a clinical perspective. Um, I just kind of want to continue to look for opportunities to put a microphone, particularly to people who are less senior in the field and have real new, fresh perspective on it. People who are veterans and have been doing this work, um, like both of you, for decades. So I think just kind of the urgency of medical storytelling, not just in moments of crisis like this one, but but always, is something that I'm really coming away from the last year um, appreciating. Such an important point. There's so little medical storytelling overall. It's not something we learn in med school. I don't think, Sam. Don't you? Would you say that's still the case now? Yes, I think uh, Emma's been one of my first and early mentors in uh, making a medical <laughs> narrative and turning experience into a into a story. Well, th this is phenomenal, and to think that we're recording this on a day that's the grand opening of New York. In fact. Uh, towards pre-COVID life, hopefully it'll stick too. We can't thank you enough for the contribution, Emma, that you made to stitch this all together as a masterful storyteller. Sorry. And to no, Sam. No, I'm thankful to all of you. Oh, no, no, no. Seriously, Sam was, 
so generous um, with his time and his insight. And it was such a privilege to learn from him as he was um, in Bellevue doing such critical work. Well, and we know Sam's got an incredible career going forward. Uh, he's probably compressed one year equal to five years or more, maybe 10, I don't know, but incredible experience that um, you were immersed in. So I'll leave it back to Abraham for some final thoughts. Yeah, so for our listeners, this is just a remarkable book, uh, especially if you know of a young person who's interested in medicine, one of the many people applying to medical school. I think this is sort of a, a, real, a real entry into what it really is like, uh, inspiring, but also realistic and beautifully told. Uh, so you've come to another, the end of another episode of Medicine and the Machine with my co-host Eric Topol. The book is Life on the Line by Emma Goldberg. And uh, Emma, we want to thank you and Sam Dubin for being with us today. Uh, remarkable achievement, both of you. Thank you. <laughs>